Good morning again, everybody. Uh, hopefully, you're having a good holiday weekend, relaxing, have a day off tomorrow. I started my holiday weekend yesterday by going to high tea with the pinky out. Has anybody ever done the high tea? No? Maybe a few of you. You do the tea, you do the crumpets. We did a double date with a couple, and they made the reservation. They said, we have a tea time tomorrow, and I was like, that's great. I'm excited about that. And I came with my clubs, and I was ready for four hours of golf, and it was very different than what I expected. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. We're dating through the alphabet, and this was our H date, so we went to high tea. If you're looking for something to do that's delightful, I recommend high tea in Lake Geneva. So that was my weekend started. Hopefully, you're having a good one. I am continuing our series on Elisha. Now, if you've been with us, you know, or maybe you're familiar with the story, Elisha is a, a prophet of the Bible that can be found in the book of Kings and Second Kings. He was a prophet of God, which is somebody who speaks on behalf of God. And he was anointed and commissioned by another prophet named Elijah. And a few weeks ago, Greg told the story of when Elijah chose Elisha to go into ministry. He chose him to follow him. And we see that Elisha jumped at the opportunity because Elijah was like a celebrity prophet. He was very well known. Elisha would have been very familiar with who Elijah was. He knew his influence and his impact that he had for the kingdom of God. He was excited to be chosen, to excited to follow him. And we see that's exactly what he did. And from that moment on, he's dedicated to following Elijah and following in his footsteps. And he's kind of his, his protege after that, learning and hopes to one day kind of be able to replicate just some of what Elijah was able to do maybe even in hopes to one day take over for him. And so we see that a, couple, a few chapters later, this actually finally comes to fruition, where Elijah is ready to end his ministry and Elisha is ready to step in to his footsteps. And we see this symbolic baton be passed from Elijah to Elisha. But it's a pretty crazy story. And it picks up in 2 Kings chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, we see this. When the Lord was about to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind, Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha, stay here, for the Lord has told me to go to Bethel. But Elisha replied, as surely as the Lord lives and you yourself live, I will never leave you. So they went down together to Bethel. The group of prophets from Bethel came to Elisha and asked him, did you know that the Lord is going to take your master away from you today? Of course I know, Elisha answered, but be quiet about it. And so there's this interesting idea we see here, and we don't know when this happened or how they, how they uh, came of this knowledge, but that they just knew that one day Elijah was going to be taken up to heaven. It's kind of an interesting thing that we see here is everybody knew that. They're like, did you know it? It's like, yeah, I, I knew that, but don't tell other people. So the prophets knew that eventually Elijah's ministry would come to an end, an end and in a crazy way, he's just going to be taken up to heaven. And we see that Elijah also asks Elisha to, to stay behind. But Elisha refuses. He refuses to leave his leader and his teacher's side. And some believe that this was kind of one of the final tests that Elijah was giving Elisha to see if he was devoted to him, to see if he was dedicated, to see if he would actually follow him, even if he said to stay behind. Other people believe that maybe it was just because Elijah was a really humble guy and he knew that his exit was going to be dramatic and miraculous and he didn't want it to be about him. And so he was kind of trying to go be on his own. But either way, we see that Elisha refuses to leave him. And two more times, the same thing happens as they're on this journey where Elijah's like, hey, I need you to just kind of hang back, stay behind. Elisha's like, no, where you go, I'm going. I'm with you every step of the journey. I'm going to walk with you on this journey. And he goes from Bethel then to Jericho, and they go together from Jericho to the Jordan River. And each time, Elisha follows him. And this isn't a quick trip like up to State Street and back. This is a long, multi-mile, maybe over 20-mile journey that they're navigating, walking, right? They don't have cars. It's a big, long journey. But he says, you know, if you go, I'm going. And they go on this big loop, and his dedication and devotion is shown through this Elisha's to Elijah. And they end up on the side of the Jordan River, right on the bank. And then we pick back up here, starting after this journey in verse 7. 50 men from the group of prophets also went to watch from the distance as Elijah and Elisha stopped besides the Jordan River. Then Elijah folded his cloak together and struck the water with it. The river divided and the two of them went across on dry ground. When they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. And Elisha replied, please let me inherit a double share of your spirit and become your successor. You have asked a difficult thing, Elijah replied. 
If you see me when I am taken away from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. And so we see Elijah, he parts the river and he makes his way across and he's about to peace out back up to heaven. He knows that he knows that's what's going to happen. He's kind of ready for it. And he does this miracle. He, he throws his cloak down into the river and he parts the river. Now, what you have to understand is that Elisha and Elijah and all the prophets, they knew who Moses was. They knew who Joshua one was. Two people about eight centuries before had done a very similar miracle. Moses famously parts the Red Sea, right? We know this miracle. But what's interesting about Elijah doing it here is they weren't being chased. They weren't in trouble. When you see this with Moses and Joshua, they were kind of fleeing the enemy. They needed to do it to survive. They needed to get away, and God creates this miracle. But Elijah is basically seemingly here just kind of showing off. He's like, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to drop one more cool bomb. Boom, river parts, and they walk through. And it seems like, what are you doing here? Like, why did you do that last little thing? But I think it was actually more for, and we'll see here in a minute, Elisha's benefit than anything else. And knowing that he was going to be carrying on what got it started through Elijah, he kind of has this inspiration. He's inspired by what he's seen by following his leader on his journey and seeing the river parted and they cross over to the place where Elijah is going to be taken. And Elisha asks Elijah for a double share of his spirit as he transitions. And now what it appears to look like, if you're just reading it through the English language and maybe our context, it appears that Elisha is asking Elijah to be twice as good as him. Saying like, hey, you were pretty good. This was some pretty good stuff, but I would like to be twice as good as you. Can you give me a double portion of your blessing, right? Like I, 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 look, at, I look up to you. You're awesome. You're my mentor. You're my leader, but I want to be better than you. Famously, LeBron James came into the league in war number 23 because his idol and his mentor was Michael Jordan, right? But LeBron James, it's well known that he has a desire to try to break every one of Michael Jordan's records, right, and become the greatest of all time. It's just unfortunate for him that it'll never happen, that Jordan will always be the greatest of all time, and no matter what he does, he'll never be better than Jordan. But he desires that. That's not what my message is about, but take that for what it's worth. <laughs> this wasn't what Elisha was asking for. In fact, the term double portion or double share was often in reference to this birthright that people would receive. So when somebody was born, the firstborn son, they would receive a birthright from their father, which was the double blessing for their family. It was the child that was supposed to go on and carry on all of the things about the family, the things that were good to carry on for generations and generations. And we see famously that it was coveted, right? That it was desired. We see that Jacob steals Esau's birthright because he wanted it so bad. He tricked him into giving it. We see this throughout generations and generations in the Bible that people desired and coveted the birthright because it meant that they would eventually take over. They would carry on the family line. They would represent the lineage of that family. They would continue what was started generations before to hopefully generations after. And so this double share, this double portion that Elisha's asking for is to be his true successor, to be the one that carries on the work of God that was so prevalent and so potent in Elijah's life. And now, we read, though, years later, what's interesting about it is we see in the Bible that Elisha actually performed exactly twice as many miracles as Elijah did, which is interesting, but that wasn't what he was requesting. So we see him request that. He's like, you know, this is what I want. What's the thing, something I can leave you with? Give me a double, give me your birthright. Give me the, the right to take on what you've started here. And then Elijah is taken up into heaven on what the Bible describes a chariot of fire. And I cannot read this story without hearing, dun, 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 right? <laughs> the old Chariots of Fire movie. And I don't know, when I get to heaven, there's so many Bible stories that I hope there's like an IMAX theater in heaven where I could just queue up these really cool stories and like watch them because I can read them and I can imagine them, but I want to see them. This is one of them I want to see. And I really hope God has that as a soundtrack as he's getting taken off into heaven. That'd be really cool. But it's this amazing, like wild thing where he's just taken off into heaven in this chariot of fire and Elisha is left there on the other side of the river. And he has this moment, we read it in the word, where he kind of grieves. Elisha tears his cloak. He grieves for his friend and his mentor and his teacher. And he sits there for a moment, but then he gets himself up and he's ready to move forward then into what he's been called to do, into his ministry, feeling the release of his successor. But what's amazing is we see something have to happen in order for him to move into that moment, picking up in verse 13. Elisha picked up Elijah's cloak, which had fallen when, it was, when he was taken up. 
And Elisha returned to the bank of the Jordan River, again, on the other side of the river. He struck the water with Elijah's cloak and cried out, Where is the Lord, the God of Elijah? Then the river divided, and Elisha went across. When the group of prophets from Jericho saw from a distance what happened, they exclaimed, Elijah's spirit rests upon Elisha. And they went to meet him and bowed down on the ground before him. And so what's interesting here is this seemingly like show-off moment from Elijah, like, hey, watch what I can do. I can part this river. Left Elisha on the other side with the only way to cross back over would be to perform the exact same miracle again, forcing him to not say, you know what? I'll get to this in a little bit. I'll, I'll become a prophet in a little while. I believe that God called me to this, but I'm gonna, he had to immediately be like, all right, I'm gonna move into this and with faith, try to part the water and it parted, symbolizing, hey, this is my time. I'm going to move into this next season. And people around affirmed that as they saw the Spirit descend upon him. And it was fulfilled. And it's just an absolutely wild story. A lot of Elisha's stories are really wild. And he goes on to perform all these amazing miracles and displays God's power. But here's the thing. This moment in the life leading up to this moment shows us this really, really cool picture of what it looks like to both be a disciple and also to disciple someone else. We see Elijah demonstrated and modeled what it meant to be a powerful prophet of God. And when he was ready, he taught and instructed and then left Elisha to carry on that ministry and move forward with it and trusted that he would do it just as good as he did it. And this is the model for discipleship. Now, if you're newer to church, that word discipleship is kind of a fancy church word for a teacher and student relationship. It's the idea that somebody invites another person into their life to observe them, to learn from them, to model for them, to teach them, to give them hands-on experience, and eventually release them out to go and replicate what they're doing for the kingdom of God. That's a discipleship process. That's a discipleship model. It's a teacher-student model. And it's something that we see in the Gospels and in the Bible, the books Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John, which tell the story of Jesus and his life. And we see this exactly in Jesus's life. It's what he did. He spent three years in ministry, Jesus did. He was here for about 33 years, but from 30 to about 33 was when he was in ministry. And we see him model this time and time again, showing people through his life and actions and teachings what it meant to follow God. He spent hours helping people to understand that it was their job to live like he lived, to allow people to see God through him and through his life and through his actions. And to live a life that was so contagious and so alluring that people were just like magnets to him, that they were drawn to him. This is the life of a disciple. This was what Jesus demonstrated. People were drawn to him. People fought crowds to be next to him. People climbed trees to see him. People would go hours sitting at his feet without food just because the words were washing over them. They couldn't help but just be around him. They would clear their calendars and their days just to hear him teach. He was a magnet to people because he lived a life that was alluring to others. But his plan was always to go back up with his father. Jesus' plan was always to go back up to heaven. His plan was to train up a whole bunch of people to be disciples, people that could carry out the good news, that could carry the message of his teachings and salvation for years and generations after he had gone back up to heaven. And if you're here and you're new to church and you're maybe unfamiliar with all of this, this is our heart. This is our heart as a church, is to have you come, not just to be comfortable and sing a couple songs and and feel good about reading a couple verses. Our heart for you is that you can come into this room and learn about what it looks like to walk like Jesus walked, to interact with people the way that Jesus interacted, to help get your handle around things and patterns and behaviors in your life that can really mimic Jesus in a holistic way. This is why when Jesus left Back up to heaven, his final command to the people listening, but his final command to each and every one of us was that we would go and do the same thing. Matthew 28 says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of of the age. This is what Jesus' heart is. This is what our heart is for each and every one of you. And maybe you're in the room and you haven't yet made that decision to follow Jesus. You're just learning about what this is all about. You're kind of investigating and that's an awesome place to be because you're on a journey. But maybe you're here because somebody in your life and your world said, hey, 
I'd love for you to come check out what God's doing uh, in, in my church and in, in helping me navigate through. And so maybe you're here as a byproduct of somebody else inviting you here to be a part of this process. This is our heart. It's not to feel good. It's not to check a box. It's to become more and more like Jesus and inspire other people to ripple out into the world to do this. And this is what Jesus did. And this is what he left his followers with. But his followers had a tough time with this. You see, they had walked with him for years, three years. He had done everything, and they had walked behind him and watched him do these things. They had eaten meals with him and listened to his teachings. They were in it with him. They were in the trenches with Jesus. And so when he says, hey, I've got to go back up to heaven, they're like, wait, what? Where are you going? He's like, I've kind of been saying this for like three years. Were you not listening? They're like, yeah, but we didn't think you were serious about it. You're actually going now? He's like, yeah, I got to go because I got to go back up so that you can multiply and you can do on this planet what I can't do while I'm here. Because we see earlier in the narrative, even before Jesus was arrested, he said this to his followers in John 16, but in fact, it is best for you that I go away. Because if I don't, the advocate, advocate is the same word as Holy Spirit in this instance, the advocate won't come. If I do go away, then I will send him to you. And so Jesus says to his close followers and the people who are listening to him, as he says to each and every one of you and myself, I know that you love him here, but that's not the end goal. The goal is to equip you and inspire you so that you can go and spread the good news, the gospel message like wildfire in this world. In fact, it's better because when I go, I'm going to send the Holy Spirit to inspire and equip you to do things that I couldn't allow you to do while I was here. He said, I want to give you a double portion, a double blessing so that you can walk in my footsteps and do on earth what I started, to model and teach and bring more and more people closer to the kingdom of God, which is exactly what Jesus is calling each and every one of his followers and each and every one of us to do, to go, to make disciples, to share the good news, to share our faith. Now, it's not lost on me that, first of all, a lot of us that have been around church maybe for a while, they're like, I think I know this, but it's not lost on me that it's difficult. You hear the idea of like sharing the good news, sharing gospel, talking about Jesus with people. Maybe your palms start sweating a little bit and your knees start shaking. You start to feel a little bit nervous about it. You're, you're like, I, I, don't know what, I don't know exactly what that looks like. Is that kind of like the guy that I drove past with the megaphone who's screaming scriptures at me? Is that what I have to do? I don't own a megaphone and I don't think I want to buy a megaphone. And that feels like a kind of weird interaction when he's just yelling at me when I'm just trying to go to Chick-fil-A. Like that's weird. <laughs> or you're like, you know, I don't have I don't have a doctorate in theology. I've never written a dissertation. I don't know the Bible front to back, and I don't know all the scriptures, and I'm not sure what to say. And we start to overthink it, and we start to get stressed out about it. But what if sharing the good news and spreading the gospel message was less like a person with a megaphone or writing a dissertation? What if it was more like just making a cup of coffee? A few weeks ago, part of the staff and myself, we went to a conference and uh, Throughout the conference, they had snacks, and they had granola bars and bananas, and they had coffee and crafts, but they also had a few tables set up with this thing called an AeroPress, which I had never heard of before this conference, and they branded it as kind of like a really, really good way to make a great cup of coffee. And they're like, you can get coffee over here, or you can go over here and try this. And what we didn't know throughout the couple days that this was happening, it was happening every break all the time. Uh, is that it was actually a sermon illustration that he brought back at the very end of the conference, which I'm going to share with you in a moment here about what it means to go out and make disciples. But what I would love to do is just take a couple moments and uh, teach you uh, and teach somebody else how to make a cup of coffee. So I have my friend Kyle. Kyle, you can come on up. Um, Kyle's going to help, help us make a cup of coffee here. So I'm going to get my hot water. This is boiling, I think. Yep. Um, all right, Kyle, how's it going? Not too bad. Good to see you. Good to see you too. So... Um, I didn't, I didn't know it was your birthday today. It is my birthday. Yeah, yeah. happy birthday, buddy. Thank you. Um, how, how old are you? Uh, something. 39. 39. All right. You don't look a day over 44, so you're great, man. <laughs> um, all right, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to okay. make a cup of coffee. Have you ever used one of these before? I have not. Okay. First of all, take these tools out. Okay. Um, that's going to be your stir and your scooper. That's the official names of them. Pull that plunger out as well. That's the plunger where you're going to push the coffee down. Yep, a little tight because it creates a vacuum seal. All right, and then pick this up, and on the bottom is a black screen. That's going to be uh, what holds the filter in. So you can okay. unscrew that from the bottom. It's like a half screw. There you go. And then what I'm going to have you do is take one of these filters and pop it in the bottom there. All right. Um, yeah, they're pretty thin. There you go. Perfect. Um, and then screw it back on. 
You're doing great so okay. far. And then you can set that right on top of the cup. So what's going to happen is it's going to make the coffee, and then we're going to actually push it into the cup here okay. in a moment. So what I need you to do next is take the scoopy, scoopy thing and uh, do a heaping uh, scoop of the grounds right here and then put it right in there. Don't worry about spilling. It gets a little messy at times, but there you go. Dude, that was really good. Yeah. All right, perfect. So now what you're going to do, Kyle, is you're going to take this and you're going to just pour, like swirl some water in up to the number four, like just above the number four here. All right. Perfect. Have you golfed yet this year, by the way? No. Oh, dude. We got I broke my arm, remember? Yeah, that's right. You yeah. broke your arm. You're old. I am getting old. All right, perfect. Now I'm going to have you take the, uh, the stirry device, and I'm going to have you do like about 20 swirls. What are you, uh, what are you most excited about this summer? Uh, just hanging out with the kids. Yeah. Getting some time. When are they done with school? They are done June 4th. They had like three snow days. So. Oh, stupid snow, except I on the snow days, and it's fun. Exactly. But we pay that tax at the end. We're we like, do. dang it, I wish there wasn't a snow day. <laughs> All right, cool. So that's, that's probably about good right there. You can add a little bit more water. You can take that out and just set it down. And then add a little bit more water. And then what I'm going to have you do is put the plunger on top and create a vacuum seal and just kind of just hold it there for a second. So wedge it in here, and then it'll stop the stuff from going down super fast while you create a vacuum seal. Now it's just got to percolate a little bit here. Okay. It'll slowly percolate, but it'll also just soak in. So sit there about 30 seconds. All right, so uh, you going to get out on the boat? Yes. Yeah? Yeah, hopefully next week or so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I've gone with you. We do the yeah. Chain of Lakes, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. There's, a, there's a place, what's it called where they, where they squirt you? Oh, it's a squirt channel. Squirt channel. Yeah. So you, you, everybody going through their nose, like you can have a water fight as you're going through. <laughs> and so our kids love it because they're just like soaking each other with super soakers. And they're like this, the... Squirt guns are like hidden under like a yeah. towel and stuff. And all of a sudden, yeah, you try to play it coy for a while, and then it's like, go! <laughs> yeah, it's a blast. All right, that'll be fun. Maybe you'll invite me. That'll yeah. be fun. Um, we'll all right. <laughs> all right, so go ahead, and now you're going to you're gonna grab the AeroPress and the cup, and it's okay. gonna, you're going to have to put some pressure. So here, you can slide it more towards you if you want. Mm -hmm. Yep, and you're going to have to put a little pressure, but it's okay. going to be pushing it through that filter now. Yep, just push it straight down, kind of straight, not at an angle. There you go. See how it's going down? It's going through there. Somehow, the science of this Magic. removes, like, the acidity, or I don't understand the science of it. I'm not smart enough. But I'll tell you what, it is a really good cup of coffee. Now, it's going to make it really strong. So what we'll do is after you're done, we'll test it. And if it's too strong, we can add a little bit of water. Um, I think you might have to hit the gym a little bit, buddy. Well, I did break my arm. So. <laughs> oh, that's your broken arm? Yeah. Dude, do you need help? No, I'm good. Thanks. That was nice. Okay. <laughs> he goes, that was nice. That felt right. I was imagining. Okay. Oh. All right. So now unscrew that, and then you're going to pop the puck, they call it, in here. So you're just going to, yeah, take that off. It won't fall out. And now push the top down, and you're going to pop that puck in there. Oh, you, that was good. It made a nice sound. All right. Try it. It's hot. I'm going to have a lawsuit. That's really good. It's good, isn't yeah. it? Is it too strong? No. No? It's smooth. It's, it's good. smooth. It is good. All right. Hey, mm -hmm. here's what I want you to do. This is okay. a button. I love your saline right. button with a cup of coffee. I'm going to give you this. All right. After service, would you be up for going out to that table and maybe teaching some people how to make coffee? Sure. Let's do I it. I appreciate it, man. All right. Thank you. All right. So Kyle will be out there teaching. If you want to learn, you can take that back to your seat. You okay. guys give it up for Kyle. Thank you, guys. Appreciate you. So throughout this this conference, we're, we're doing this. We're, we're going up and we're learning how to make coffee. And I went up the first time I had no clue. I'd never even heard of an AeroPress. So I get up there. I'm like, I, I do want a really good cup of coffee. And so I went up and they had people helping to teach. And actually the people helping were occupied. The guy next to me was making a cup of coffee and I, he could see me kind of fumbling. He's like, hey, can I, can I teach you how to make it? I was like, yeah, for sure. So he, as he was making his, he taught me how to make my cup of coffee, and I learned how to make it right there and then. And then afterwards, is able to bring some people from our staff and show them what I had learned, and then they became coffee makers. And actually, I was a really good coffee maker. I had way too much coffee throughout that conference. I was just shaking all over the place because I, I became too good at it. Uh, but it was cool because you'd go up... And you had learned and you could teach somebody else. And this is obviously what they were doing in the conference is modeling a life of discipleship and what it looks like to learn and then go on and teach and equip other people to be coffee makers, but to be disciples, to be followers of Jesus. And we learned at this conference that it's fairly simple. And sometimes we overcomplicate it. And sometimes we add stuff to it that's not there. 
but it translates so perfectly to how it looks to reach other people in our world, to go out and love people in our areas of influence, to press into this opportunity that was given to us as a command from Jesus to go into the world and model what he taught. But it takes effort. It does take some intentionality. And sometimes it gets messy. Kyle did a pretty good job, but sometimes you can spill some grounds. You can, you can maybe spill a little bit of the coffee. When I first made it at home, even after the conference, I kind of made a mess on my counter. My wife was laughing at me because of how messy it was. But there's a learning curve to it, and it's okay that it's a little bit messy. But I got in there, and I started doing it, and I started making it. And, and as you're discipling people, you got to get in there and do it and be out there and talking to people. And some people will be more receptive and some people won't, and that's okay as well. But eventually what happens is you learn and you become confident and you become an expert in it. At the conference, there were even people that would come up and teach you like the expert ways to do an arrow press. You're like, yeah, you got to invert it and then you got to flip it and then you got to pray over it and then you got to do a spin and stuff. You're like, all right, that seems like a lot, but the people became experts in it and they would teach others how to become experts in it. And that's what happens. But as we're going out, as we are doing the Great Commission, I think there's something that we can do as a person to remember what it looks like to actually be a disciple maker, and that's to press. We need to press into our community. And the first word with press is to be purposeful. It takes intentionality. It really does. Jesus didn't leave this planet and say, hey, I'm going to go back up to heaven and magically everybody who's born from now until eternity is going to know exactly what I taught and how to live. He said, no, I'm going to go up to heaven. I need you. I need you to be a mission carrier, to go out into the world with the mission that I've given you and and deliver it to other people, to be disciple makers. And that comes from living a purposeful life, to be intentional, to trust the Holy Spirit that he's guiding us on this journey, that he's putting people in our path, in our area of influence that we need to and should come alongside of and journey with and talk to and inspire, to be invitational, You see, Kyle, he didn't know on Wednesday that he was going to come make coffee, but I invited him into the process. I said, hey, would you help me with something? Would you come up here and help me make some coffee? And I could have been nervous to do that. I mean, what's the worst he could have said is no. But he said, sure, I'd love to come do that. But I was invitational. I brought him into the process. I taught him. And now he's going to go and teach some of you how to do that. But I made sure I was equipped. I was purposeful. I had all the things. I was ready to go. So it takes somebody being purposeful, but it also takes you being relational. Making disciples and inspiring people cannot happen and if we're not face-to-face with them, if we're not in relationship with other people. If we walk down the halls at work and we refuse to make eye contact with people, if we walk down the hallways at school and we don't talk to people, if we pull into our garage and we shut the garage door before any of our neighbors can see that we're home or come over and say, hello, we can't, we can't actually do this process. We need to be purposeful, but we need to be relational. It's amazing what can happen in a meal, over a lunch, over a dinner, over a really good cup of coffee. It's amazing the relational equity you can build as you break down walls and allow them to be more comfortable with you. But it doesn't happen if we avoid people, if we're not relational. It takes these relational connections. But the third thing is it needs to be embodied. The number one reason that people don't like Christians is because they say they're hypocritical. They say what they're taught and what they read and what they believe doesn't line up with how they act. And so for us to be able to carry this mission out into the world, we need to be purposeful, we need to be relational, but it needs to actually be what we believe. We need to be actually at the core of who we are trying to model. We're not going to get it perfect, and nobody expects you to get it perfect, but we're trying our hardest to model a life of Jesus to model the life that he taught. It needs to be embodied. It needs to be who we are to our core in an unhypocritical way. And we need to do it unapologetically as well. And so we're purposeful and relational and it's embodied, it's who we are, but it's also pretty simple. We don't need to overcomplicate it. It's, it's one-on-one relationships. It's meeting people where they're at. It's talking to people. But we sometimes get in our head and we, we make it something that it's not. I remember Greg was talking about this experience with the coffee at the conference. And he said he was making coffee and somebody was helping this other guy next to him make coffee. And they asked a question that I asked. They said, hey, would you, would you mind actually showing somebody else how to make coffee? And he goes, no. <laughs> Wait, what, you won't? He's like, I won't do it. He just locked up, completely froze. He panicked. He's like, I, I, I don't know if he was thinking, I don't, I don't really understand the process. I, I'm going to screw it up. I don't know what I'm doing. But he locked up. He said he wouldn't do it because maybe in his head he overcomplicated it. Maybe in his head he was worried that he was going to screw it up. He was making it something that it wasn't. But Jesus wants us to keep it simple. 
It's living life. It's being relational with other people, meeting people at the place they're at, having maybe tough conversations. Tough conversations are okay because that's life, right? That's tension. Tension, what it's going to do is it's actually going to lead to growth for both you and the other people as well. So it's a purposeful, relational, embodied process that's simple. And if you do all that, what it's going to allow you to do is eventually share your story with the other people. You see, what's going to happen is people are going to live with you and be in relationship with you, and eventually they're going to notice, man, something's a little bit different about them. The, the, way, the way that they interact with other people, the way that they have a peace when a lot of other people don't have a peace, the way that the relationships or marriage or friendships just look a smidge different, and it's not that they see you as a perfect person, but they're like, there's something different about them. And eventually what's going to happen is in their own way, they're going to ask you about it. And you have the opportunity then to, with all this relational equity, start to share the story of what Jesus has done in your life. You don't have to have the answers. You just have to understand, I, 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 this is who I was. And because I've been coming to church and reading my Bible and gave my life to Jesus, this is what it is now. And I don't really even fully understand it, but this is my story. And you get an opportunity to move alongside of somebody and share what Jesus has done in your life. I remember about 14 years ago, I was at a, uh, a bachelor party. We went skydiving, and then we were camping, and uh, it was just this fun time. And I had gone with a whole bunch of guys that I had grown up with since I was five years old. This friend that was getting married, I've known since I was five, and his neighbor uh, I had known since I was five as well. So a long time we had been buddies. And uh, we had just gone through life together, and uh, they knew that I was a Christian. They knew that I went to church, and they would razz me sometimes, like, oh, Tyler's got to go to church tomorrow, but nothing. I mean, they, we were all buddies. We loved each other, but we just were, were friends. We had this relational equity with each other, and at that bachelor party, I was sitting next to one of my friends, and we started talking about life, and he had some really heavy stuff going on, and he, he started talking to me. He said, you know, I don't, I don't know what it is, but I just kind of feel empty. Like, I just feel like something's missing, like there's a hole inside. And I remember the Holy Spirit being like, this is the moment. And I said, hey, man, I don't, I don't really know everything that's going on with you, but in my experience, in myself, and what I've seen in others close to me is that feeling can be filled by only Jesus. And he's the one that can come in and, and fill the empty spaces in our heart. And... Truthfully, I don't remember a lot more of the conversation. It wasn't like this moment where he was chariots of fire up to heaven or anything like that. It was pretty, pretty like benign after that. And I remember years later, uh, he came up to me and he said, hey man, I, I gave my life to Jesus and I'm getting baptized next week. And he goes, hey, do you remember that conversation that we had on the dock sitting next to the lake? And I was like, kind of. He's like, that's the moment that started this journey for me because I was purposeful and relational and I, I lived a life that lined up as much as I could with Jesus. And in a simple conversation, I had an opportunity to share my story with him. And that's what discipleship's all about. It's the simplicity of making a cup of coffee for somebody and teaching them. In 1 Corinthians 11, Paul says, and you should imitate me as I imitate Christ. That's our job. Is to, is to live differently, to live a life that looks like Jesus. As he said, go into the world and tell others, this is what we do. We imitate him. We make cups of coffee for people, but we teach them how to go and do it as well. And so what's really cool is we're coming up into this week that we've done for many, four or five years now called Love Your State Line Week. And this is actually a very real and tangible way that we can do this. I love it because a lot of us think like, man, that's, I, I, I need to do that. That's right. Like, I, I hear that. That's true. I need to go out and share my faith. And, but this is a real step that we can take. And on your seats, you have a card. What we're going to do over the next few minutes is just play a song. And I encourage you just to sit. You can do two things here. You can pull out your phone and you can actually register for Love Your State Line if you haven't. And on there, you're going to pick how many acts of love that you want to do and you and your family want to do together. You're just kind of committing to this is what we're going to do as a family or this is what I'm going to do as an individual and uh, this coming week. And you have to get real specific when you register, but you can also register for either the meal packing or the helping Rock for Rescue mission on June 1st. Uh, but also what I want you to do is take this card and start to write down actual things that you're planning on doing this week that you can be held accountable to. Hold yourself accountable. Put it in a place where you can see it on your fridge or your desk at work where you're going to check them off as you do them. And the other thing I want you to do is to take this moment and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you 
about people in your world and your circle of influence that he wants you to move alongside. Because if I've been talking and somebody has popped in your head, that's not an accident. That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, I, I've been working on your heart and this person needs a little of that too. Would you be willing to go teach them how to make a cup of coffee? And it starts with us saying yes. And so as you're listening to this song, write maybe the initials or the full name of those people on this card so that you're reminded this week of who God is calling you to move alongside of in a purposeful, relational way. As you embody Christ and keep it simple and have an opportunity maybe in a week or a month or a year or maybe years down the road to share what Jesus has done in your life, to start that process. So over this next song, I want to be intentional with that. Uh, And what's going to happen is we're going to allow God to move. We're going to allow the Holy Spirit to move as we have an opportunity here to figure out what does it look like to make figurative cups of coffee for people in our world and in our community, to purposely and relationally be with people, to embody Jesus and to take a simple way to bring him into a lost world that desperately needs him. And you can be that vessel. And you can, and God wants you to be that vessel. So let me pray for you, and then we're going to reflect. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the story of Elisha that shows us a model of discipleship. But God, thank you for Jesus to re- that reiterated that, that called us to something higher and better, that invited us into the narrative to carry out the mission and to spread the good news like wildfire. God, we don't want to be a roadblock. We want to be a vessel. We want to be a conduit for your power. And so as we spend these next few minutes thinking and reflecting, allowing the Holy Spirit to move, I pray that you bring acts of love to our mind, but also people to our mind that you want us to move alongside of, to make a cup of coffee for. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.